Mm. Be surprised, but there's no tagline for Marvel Zombies. But there is a tagline for Slashers, a podcast about movies and horror for those who love horror. I said it correctly. Woo! You can all go to hell and Woo! stop. You can stop waiting on bated breath. I know. Thank you all so much. With me this week is a great lineup of the most meek and soft-spoken motherfuckers in the world <laughs> on, a, on a presentation episode where I'm going to be yelling about comic books. So we'll see how this works out. Chad, why don't you apologize to these people in advance for being too polite to me? I I am so sorry. And Jimothy, the Jim turn Jim sideburns. What? Can you get mutton chops? <laughs> I probably could. Like, should we do you, starburns like from yeah. community oh yeah yeah have you do you okay i know chad doesn't music but do you know who lemmy from motorhead is because you oh, could really course. rock the lemmy yeah i would pay money to see this all right patreon patrons new goal <laughs> at, at 10 patrons no we already have 10 at a, at 100 <laughs> patrons jim's gonna shave his beard to be lemmy from motorhead and we will officially change his name on the show to jim turn von lemmyvich <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is, we've already talked about this in advance. This is going to be a weird episode, and it's looking like it's going to be a two-parter based on all the research that we've done. Marvel <laughs> Zombies, a series I did not like when it first came out, but you bet your fucking bottom dollar I bought the fucking trade paperback. That was right, right before I went hard, raw dog deep into comic books. I mean, I'd always liked comics, but it, I started collecting shortly after this, and thank God, because I, I never really liked this until I read Ultimate Fantastic Four. Jed, so you your ever, view is a lot better now. Love it now. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever collect any comics? I did, but it was so long ago and they were haphazard everywhere, like single issues. Like I never got the opportunity or money to like fully get a full series of anything. So yeah. Jim, what about you? I never did for some reason because I'm into other nerdy stuff. I have no idea why it never happened. Yeah. I had a lot of Marvel comic cards where it had like the powers and whatnot, but I, a lot of the TV we just never had the spare money to buy. Exactly. So the times that I would buy stuff would be like with my grandparents who'd, and I'd go and buy like, I was a dumb shit kid. So I, like, I vividly remember one of my favorite comics as a kid was just a random team up between Spider-Man and Nova. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, Nova looks so cool. <laughs> but at the time he, I think he was only appearing in new warriors. So I, there was like nothing where I could just get Nova. So like there was no way he was going to be my favorite superhero of all time. And so it was kind of like, like you said, there's a weird, you know, and I also like, the solar man and a couple weird like indie yes. comics where it's like what the fuck how did that end up in my collection of course i still have them but yeah i bought a lot of uh spawn for the artwork love the spawn artwork and todd mcfarlane hugely famous for his work on spider-man of course. yeah exactly actually spider-man number one that he did so it wasn't the amazing spider-man spider-man number one was at the time it was the top selling comic of all time and then that was replaced by jim lee's work with x-men but the you know 90s were huge and they were rife with the comic book boom where you know you had the, the foil covers and everything because in the 90s yep. you had these people who were like oh well i'm going to cash in every comic is going to be as valuable as action comics number one because of that i'm gonna buy 10 copies of everything so the market was artificially inflated you had series that would build up and then renumber it number one 10 issues in why because an issue number one would sell because they would think it's the debut of your next Superman. Fun fact, there's already a Superman. You're not going to replace Superman. Obviously, it's DC Comics, but you get my point because that's the most valuable comic in existence. Right. So, but even, you know, you can look at other comics like Flash Gordon and stuff. Those things are unique and rare because those comics were never meant to last. Kids would read them. Kids would throw them away. There was no such thing as comic book collecting in the 40s when these things came out. So those are rare and that's what makes them valuable. They aren't oversaturated and reprinted and printed under a foil <laughs> cover and printed under a polytechnic spree color. Right. Blah, blah. With seven variant covers. It's crazy <laughs> how many. And like this series is interesting because every time they sold out, they would do a new cover, which is a great excuse because so I was listening to an interview with Arthur Sudam who did all the covers and he was talking about people were buying this trade paperback just for those covers. You know, this guy would spend weeks and weeks working on them and recreating them. And it was kind of a kitschy idea to recreate other famous comic book covers that Joe Casada had, who was the editor uh, in chief at the time. And so it's kind of by happenstance that like people were buying these as good gifts because it was a self-contained story. You, it looks good on your shelf. But then thanks to people like Robert Kirkman, Mark Millar, you actually had some decent substance, especially if you get into it 
in the Ultimate Fantastic Four stuff. So anything you guys want to note before we just dive into it and I just ruin your lives with a bunch of comic book trivia? We're ready to be ruined. Perfect. If you have any questions along the way, I encourage you to ask me. And if you, the fans, have questions, comments, or concerns, reach out to us at slasherspod at gmail.com and slasherspod on How Instagram. How did Deadpool and Wolverine's healing factor not counteract the virus? It's actually specifically explained that it, just, it doesn't. It, like, it acknowledges. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. Well, because if you look all at right. it, Spider-Man, Hulk, Wolverine, Deadpool all have the virus. And it, it, later on, I believe it's Marvel, Marvel Zombies 5, if I'm not mistaken. Mystique is a zombie and she's frequently, she's eating Deadpool's brain as it keeps regenerating, but he's not infected with the virus. So it's slightly different. But as soon as he's infected, he doesn't heal. There's a whole story arc between Marvel Zombies 3 and 4 where he's just ahead. Hmm. There you go. You thought you were going to throw me off my game? You can't do it. Oh, we got more. Let's get Shit. going. No. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to kind of talk just generally about with the fans, and I guess you guys can be privy to that conversation as well. I am a very weird guy. Like, No. Yeah. I can listen to the same fucking song a trillion times, never worry about it. I can watch the same horror movie from the 80s a trillion times. But comics is the one media that I absolutely love following continuously and just getting more and more and more. Um, very rarely do I read things multiple times. If I do, it's something that stands out. And funny enough, it's usually Mark Millar stuff. And we're going to touch on him and just I'm going to gush. But <laughs> so if you ever have recommendations, I will always read your comic book recommendations. I might feign interest in your fucking Serbian film or whatever. I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'll totally watch that. But if you recommend a comic, there's like a 90% chance. If it's easy to find, I will read it. So please, by all means. Next point of order. First thing I wanted to mention. The reason that we're doing this episode is, A, Marvel has a new series coming out called Marvel Respawn, which is also going to feature Galactus, and that's coming out. Then Disney Plus is going to be featuring the What If series for Marvel. And in that series, you're dealing with Marvel zombies, at least in some form or fashion. So there's going to be at least one iteration of it. Wait, so that, for sure? Yeah, that's absolutely. That's so cool. there's like a lot of what ifs that they're going to work on, right? Yeah, it's going to be an ongoing series. And what's kind of cool, like Black Mirror or something where they're mm -hmm. going to do small like snippets of like the universe in a whatever Captain America being Hydra really sort of thing. Exactly. Well, that's Secret Empire. But yeah. Yeah. Also, one of the cool things is apparently for the comic book stuff that I have read, they're going to be trying to get the actual actor to do the voice work, which I think is super radical. But nowadays with recording technology, I mean, if we fuckheads can record this podcast in a studio garage, why can't you go to Chris Evans's bathroom, put up a couple of sound curtains and just start recording him? Yeah. And especially if you're going to pay him the kind of money I imagine they're going to pay him for Disney Plus. <laughs> Fuck, man, I'm already getting spammed out the asshole by Disney. Yep. I'm like, just give me the fucking service. I'll already pay for it. You don't have to keep. I already want to. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna cancel Netflix for it. To be honest with you, but yeah. Between, I mean, I would cancel it if I didn't steal it from Jimmy. Well, between <laughs> you and four other people, yeah. Legitimately, like, oh wait, I forgot to cancel that. So Disney Plus is gonna come with Hulu, and I have Tubi. I never have to watch anything else. Shutter, okay, but I mean, those. That's a, a pretty damn good triumph. Well, the great thing about the streaming thing is we could all just share nowadays. I doubt Disney will let you share. Yeah, they are pretty evil sometimes. So one thing that I really love about Marvel Zombies. A lot of people want to criticize the entire series of it, right? And say, oh, well, it's just over sensationalized. It's, it's overdone. They keep going to the well. They're beating a dead horse kind of thing. But it's a linear progression that sure, there are a lot of iterations of it, but you don't need to have everything. I was reading an article that I think is really fascinating. In 1968, if you bought every single Marvel comic that came out that month, you would spend a whopping 68 cents. Hmm. Fast forward to 69, a year later, the progression almost doubles to dollar eighty. You go to eighty six, twenty four dollars. You go to nineteen ninety three, one hundred and fifty dollars, which oh is when the bubble God. bursts. But if you wanted to, in two thousand and ten, buy every single issue of a Marvel comic that came out, you would spend two hundred and fifty dollars a month based on seventy two titles, a minimum of two ninety nine, as high as three ninety nine. Wow! All right. So say what you will. I will sacrifice secret invasion for fun, self-contained stories like this is very frequent. So. Yeah, I totally get that. And kind of talking about where the bubble burst is very important when it comes to talking about this series. A lot of people don't realize that like the MCU as you have it is the ultimate universe. And the ultimate universe comes out of a place of complete 
desperation. Marvel at the time was in bankruptcy. Brian Michael Bendis, Mark Millar come and tour the Marvel offices. Mark Millar has said, and I don't know how joking it is, somebody offers him a coffee. He takes the order for the coffee. The guy comes back and asks him for money for the coffee. That's how financially destitute Marvel was. They're trying to recruit <laughs> someone to be an employee and they're charging them for the coffee. Mark Millar had to take a pay cut from DC to come to Marvel, right? It was destitute. They were selling file cabinets just to make do. They had to keep the lights off to save power. There's actually stories of people finding thousands of dollars worth of art at the back of file cabinets that they bought for hundreds of bucks in New York. Yeah, that's insane. It was just completely <laughs> mismanaged and it was garbage. So these two you know, hot shot guys come in and they create the ultimate universe. Brian Michael Bendis spearheading, of course, Ultimate Spider-Man, which he wrote every issue of until he departed to DC. Mark Millar did the Ultimates mainline, which is effectively your Avengers. And they both did Ultimate Fantastic Four. Hmm. Now, Mark Millar in his, I mean, if you look at that guy, he has this weird, I don't know if it's a sixth sense or what, but he's very finger on the pulse kind of guy. If you look at his properties, you're talking Wanted, you're talking Kingsman, you're talking Kick-Ass. And yeah. it resonates with a lot of people. Like, I'm sure you might haven't read the comics, but you've seen all those movies, right, guys? Yep, yeah, multiple times. And each time, they'd be, sure, they kind of have a same similar feel. It's kind of that I'm a tough guy kind of thing. But there's substance to it. It's pretty rich, right? Oh, yeah. And it's referential. And so they had their first summit or retreat. And Marvel in the heyday would go and they'd fly people out to a fucking mountain paradise and they'd all have <laughs> cabins and they'd come out and they'd talk or they would go and there would be an event. At this point in time, Marvel is so destitute. Where is their retreat? In the fucking break room. <laughs> and so Brian Michael Bendis loves to tell the story about Mark Millar where he's pitching ideas and he's like, Marvel zombies, but they're actually zombies. <laughs> Apparently editor in chief, Joe Quesada was so like looking down his nose at Mark Millar. He said, quote, why did I even fly you out here from Scotland? <laughs> like, can you fucking believe that? So in this room, you have Brian Michael Bendis, Joe Quesada. I mean, it's a treasure trove of people. And they all look at him. Brian Michael Bendis said that he was so embarrassed for Mark to have said that. And then you have what is Marvel's highest grossing trade paperback of all time. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's a, and it's an idea that Mark Millar threw away. Oh. He always intended for it to be a story arc and then for somebody else to take over. I mean, how, that's how many good ideas he has. Think about Civil War. Think about Red Sun. He had the idea for Superman Red Sun when he was six years old. Wow. Do you know what that is? Isn't that where he loses? Superman loses his powers or is that where he goes evil? Or it's where he crash lands in Soviet Russia okay. and becomes that evil guy. So okay, yeah. you're right. All he right. is evil, but it's for different kind of nefarious. Right. Things. And you have like rusky Batman with his like fur hat and stuff. Yeah. Great shit. But anyway, we'll move on from there. Just kind of to contextualize, literally as they're doing that tour that I'm talking about where they charge Mark Millar for his coffee, Ryan Michael Bendis is thinking to himself, am I going to write the last Spider-Man comic? That's how financially <laughs> That's destitute. That's crazy. This is pre-MCU. And this is one of the things that makes that deal where they self-finance and make their own movies and then become the powerhouse that gets bought by Disney. You can definitely hang it on Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Millar, if not exclusively, then predominantly. Hmm. So these guys are where it's at. I'm a huge fan. Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Millar were so invaluable to Marvel that Joe Quesada wouldn't let them ride in the same cab. It was like Air <laughs> Force One rules where he's like, we're completely fucked. No, absolutely can't do it. So <laughs> I'd like to take you to July 13th, 2005. Here you have Ultimate Fantastic Four, issue 21. They are from Earth 2149. And this is what's called the, quote, hunger virus. Now, this comic, aside from debuting Marvel Zombies, you know what else it's famous for in the Marvel Ultimate Universe? Mm, what? Debuting their version of the Fantastic Car. Oh. oh, yeah. Okay. What I, I love <laughs> me some Ultimate Fantastic Four because they took this hokey, antiquated, inaccessible comic. And they modernized it to a way that was very accessible. And if you read that comic series until the bitter end, the payoff is amazing. Literally, the story arc of that Reed Richards and that Ben Grimm and that Sue Storm, perfect. Okay. We'll move on. So we had Mark Millar, who is doing the writing for it. He and Brian Michael Bennett had switched off a few times. Funny enough, 
they were supposed to collaborate at one point, and Mark Millar, being the mensch that he is, just let Brian Michael Bendis get paid all of it hmm. because he thought that he did predominantly amount of the work and didn't tell Bendis that he did it. So it wasn't until payment had already been processed that Bendis found this out and he couldn't do anything about it, which I love the fact that like, haha, not only am I going to do something nice, but you'll never know about it. It's like the <laughs> Buddha Dharma, right? Is something good if you're acknowledged to have done it or is it good for goodness sake? But I digress. The artist for this progress is David Land, who, if you know your Marvel Comics history, did Star Wars Tales, Star Wars Infinity, Infinities, Empire Strikes Back. He's pretty well renowned for doing very photorealistic stuff. If you look at Alex Ross's art, he almost exclusively takes still photos and then paints it. Very similar style in the way that this is presented. Very, very photorealistic. So originally, and this is what I was telling Chad before we started, I wish that I would have been reading comics as they occurred at this time. Because as it's teased, this event is called, quote, crossover. And all of the promotional art is the young Reed Richards from the Ultimate Fantastic Four looking through a portal and seeing a slightly older Reed Richards with the gray in his hair. And they both look astonished. And you can tell they're both Mr. Fantastic because they have like the stretchy limbs and they have like exaggerated features. No mention of zombie at all. So it starts off in what I think is one of the coolest ideas for a show ever. 150 million years ago with the thing knocking out a dinosaur. <laughs> and you have multiple members of the Fantastic Four spanned across the timeline. And it goes back to the primordial ooze where these time travelers who call themselves the Chrono Bandits are holding an amphibian hostage, which is the first thing that comes out of the primordial ooze. That is life as you know it. And they're saying, we will destroy all of life unless you meet our demands. <laughs> and yeah, at this point, Mr. Fantastic saves the day. Dr. Storm says, realizes he is, quote, a taste for being reckless because Reed is so desperate at this point. He wants to prove himself to Dr. Storm. He wants to prove himself in general. He wants to be cavalier. He starts communicating with another person that he knows is himself. If I'm not mistaken, there's even like a hologram where it's him and his son, Franklin Richards. And it's you're like, oh shit, this is 616. This is the first time this ultimate universe meets over with the original prime Marvel universe. How cool is that? So he jumps in this dimensional portal of the other Reed helps him design and build and he gets over there. And the whole world is in shambles. And then he looks over and there is the zombie Fantastic Four, quote, ever get the feeling you've been had? <laughs> and that's where issue one ends. Could you imagine the shock and awe if you had no idea that it was going to be zombies to be like, wait, what? Dude, that's an awesome cliffhanger. It's great. Yeah. And what's crazy is this only a three issue arc. That's how many good ideas there are in Ultimate Fantastic Four. Like it is so rich with good content. Then we move on to issue 22. We reveal their version of the origin of the, what they call the hunger virus. There's okay. a few different names that kind of get thrown around, but it's zombieism, right? There's a huge conspiracy theory about this. Right, because they don't actually tell you what happened, right? Or how it came about? In this theory, it revolves around who is the one who's the first zombie. Okay. So you hear about a crack of light in the sky and a superhero falling. The superhero has a bland, long sleeve top and a cape. He has coiffed hair that has a curl in the front. Now, if you know your Sentry, Sentry yeah. he's a Marvel character who's modeled after a Superman in a lot of ways, but he has severe psychosis and a split personality disorder, blah, blah, blah. This version is colored like the Sentry, but there's articles and there's documents that show that this was a recolor later on. And given the fact that there is no logo on the chest that's visible, lots of people think that originally it was a joke to be Superman. <laughs> That'd be interesting. <laughs> Which it, you could see how easily it is to change Superman into the Marvel parody Superman. Right. But the idea being he just erupts through the, the dimensional portal, lands. When the Avengers go to investigate, boom, you have the world's mightiest heroes or Earth's mightiest heroes, fucking zombies. How long do you think it takes? for the entire earth to be taken over by zombies. A day? Four, Four days. days. <laughs> and one of the key reasons being Quicksilver, the fastest man right. in the Marvel universe, going through, running across the ocean, biting people, biting every <laughs> single superhero. And you have rapid change, which is awesome. So, now, so I kind of did some research on it. And some people were saying that the virus also had its own like sentient to like 
push the virus out more? Is that true? That is true. That doesn't okay. come out until significantly later. Oh, okay. In well, other about like a, almost like a hive mind kind of aspect to it. Correct. Fred Van Lente in Marvel Zombies 3 really explores that. And there's some very, very cool imagery that has to do with it. Okay. But yeah, it's an interesting idea. And in this, your first glimpse that things are not where they're supposed to be, aside from the fact it's in shambles, you get to know immediately in this issue, they refer to Captain America as Colonel America. So huh. you know this isn't 616. It's fair game. Anyone can die. And that's something they established very early on. The amount of characters who just disappear or reappear as zombies, it's awesome. Yeah. So Or are ripped in half. <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> now, one thing that I'd like to tie in together with the earlier comment about the Sentry being potentially a rebranded Superman. This applies to Jim. So, Jim, I'm only going to talk to you. Chad, mind your own fucking business. <laughs> Jim, are you aware of Marvel Zombies versus Army of Darkness? No. Oh. So, your boy, Ash, comes through at the same time as the Sentry. He ends up shooting the sentry in the chest with his boomstick. What shaped hole do you think he leaves in the sentry's shirt but the Pentagon that's in Superman's costume? So it's another big nod, <laughs> but that was an interesting crossover with Dynamite Comics. So that wasn't DC or Marvel. That was a, a split branding, which is pretty rad. We'll get into that. Mm. Thoughts? Where can I get those? You can steal them online because they're not on Marvel Unlimited because it was a co-branded thing. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how to find comics online, but if you wanted to <laughs> read comics online, you might just Google Dot com. that. <laughs> so, yeah, and to your point, they can, in this iteration in Marvel Zombies, they consume the Earth in 24 hours. Later okay. issues, say four days. The reason being Magneto's resistance. So we'll get into that. Right, on Planet M or whatever it is. Or Asteroid M. Asteroid yeah. M, okay. See, so you, you did a bunch of research, dog. You know all about this shit. <laughs> You're my second in command. <laughs> now we have to convince Jim. <laughs> You're going to be converted a bitch. So one thing when it comes to Quicksilver, I'm sure you're like, how does the fastest man alive get converted into a zombie, right? So in the ultimate universe, there seems to be a thing about incest between him and Scarlet Witch. There's siblings. Yes. It's in the normal MC. That's not the case. I don't think that was Mark Millar's intention. Whatever. Point being, Quicksilver sees his sister in mortal peril. So what does he do? He runs. He picks her up. He whisks her away. He's a bolt of lightning on the sky. But you know who isn't his sister? Mystique. And Mystique bites him that way, having lured him <laughs> masterfully. Huh. And that's one of the great things about having zombies that are sentient, that are smart, that are sophisticated. Because at first it bothered me. I didn't like it when I started reading Marvel zombies. Like, it just doesn't make sense. It made more sense to be primal and fighting and like the chaos, but to be conniving, I didn't like. But then after the whole theme being the only reason you get there is because of that cleverness, then you like it a lot more. Right. Because when they actually are converted into zombies, they get kind of like crazy with hunger, but they maintain their intelligence. Correct. Which is, yeah, a little bit different of being like the zombie genre. The way I defined it was, quote, clarity through cannibalism. The yeah. hunger is so distracting and all-consuming that it's only in those brief reposes after they eat people that they have that kind of lucidity, which really comes into play in Kirkman's Marvel Zombies. Right. Awesome. I was more interested in how did the thing get converted with, like, rock skin. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to get there? I Because I can skip ahead or we can do it now. <laughs> Up to you, man. But I'm just Jimmy, curious. Jimmy, you're the call. Uh, we'll do it later. Okay. All right. So... In this situation, Teaser. Reed, yeah, <laughs> dude, it's, it, I love it. I love it. I love it so much. So Reed gets saved by Magneto, who, if you know Jake, Magneto is one of my all-time favorite characters. I think that he's inarguably top three villains of Marvel ever. Yeah, I agree. Like him, Doom, and Namor, they're the best. And all of them are so compelling because they're self-righteous, right? They all think that what they're doing is right. Yes. Now, in this iteration, there is a reference where... Magneto is talking to one of his alkalites on Asteroid M, and he believes that he made a deal with some interdimensional creature which caused all of this. That's only touched on again in one of the farther Mar Marvel Zombies series. I think it's three or four or even later than that. But my point is, it's never really touched on. In fact, it's completely explained away in Marvel Zombies 5. But he's at least operating under the belief that he was trying to kill humanity for the sake of mutants, and he failed. And now the only people that he's saving, aside from Reed, who's not a mutant, 
Reed is mutated, but he's not himself a mutant. The only people that Magneto is saving are humans until he can get to Asteroid M. So that's a huge change. And the issue ends with the zombie Fantastic Four coming through to 2149, the ultimate universe. Right. That's another great cliffhanger. We were like, what the fuck? Like, is this failed science experiment already over? Are we already done with this Marvel Ultimates bullshit? Because you got to keep in mind, they had already tried rebranding before. They had very recently before this done Marvel Heroes Reborn. They had done other things. They had done the new Universal. They'd done stuff to try and rebrand and be fresh again, and it all failed. So at this point, for all fans, no, this was just a one-off. Right. And they're just going to dissolve it that way. How fucking cool. (laughs) Now, issue 23 has some awesome splash pages. Land nails it with these. And I, as you know, the comic nut who reads up on everything, I love the fact that you're talking about a lot of 80s, 70s costume designs. Yes. You look at Luke Cage, he's got the yellow blouse on. (laughs) It's great. And these pages really speak for themselves. Now, the Fantastic Four comes to save Reed. There's some pretty great imagery when it comes to the Fantastic Four in the Marvel Ultimate Universe. Later on, they come back because they are imprisoned, but then gets Reed dies because his head gets blown up by Sue. Sue in the Ultimate Universe, super competent. Probably the strongest of the Fantastic Four by a far margin. Yeah. So when she came to save him, she... I don't know if I heard this right because I was watching the video of the guy doing the like recap of it. Yeah. And I can't tell what he was actually reading from it or what was his own. But anyways, he said that she turned the zombie eyes invisible. And so that's why they couldn't see. So she turns the optic nerves optic invisible. Nerves. So they can't see because of that. So she kills that version of Reed. But the other Fantastic Four, she just blinds so they can get around them. And then they lock them into the room. But right. Reed had filtered through with his you know, slippery stretchiness through these like impenetrable doors. So he had to die. So she blows up his head from inside of it with a force field. But the other ones, <laughs> she manipulates like that. And how just inventive. But she blinds them by making their optic nerve invisible, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's great. You can't it's refract not just light. like, exactly. I blinded you. They like went into a little bit deeper where like... She can actually yeah, make a piece of their eye invisible, which is awesome. And that's what Millar does so much. And one of the great things about you know, Fantastic Four in the Ultimate Universe, if you look at Fantastic Four in the original universe, they're all ripoff characters. You'd already had the elongated man. You'd already had like, you know, Korg from Thor, the right. rock man. Yeah. They'd already had those by the time they have the Fantastic Four. You'd already had an invisible girl. You'd already had a human torch. Marvel had a human torch. Marvel Comics issue one is Jim Hammond, the human torch, who who is one of the invaders, who's like him fighting Namor was what blew up Marvel Comics. I mean, this is it's a crazy amount of history there. And they're all just repurposed characters. Right. I mean, if you look at Stanley's early work, he'd already had a character named Magneto who was a superhero before he made the X-Men Magneto. They were Hmm. just flying by the seat of their pants. The deliberation was not there at all. But they took these characters that are kind of trite and contrived and they talk about making them elemental, right? That's one of the things because they, they get their powers not from cosmic rays, but through dimensional travel. So Reed, of course, is liquid. Sue is air. Johnny's fire. The thing is Earth. I mean, if you're an Avatar The Last Airbender pan, you didn't just come. I don't know what I can do for you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the thing beats the Hulk, which I love. In this, because the thing is a good guy, and ultimate Ben Grimm is great. The Hulk and I never, we have a very love hate relationship. I either think that the Hulk comic is the best thing I've ever read, and I just can't stop gushing about it, or I hate it because he's bland. And he makes a great villain. It's, yeah, it's one of the harder comics to just get right with unlimited power, yet. I'm a sulking giant beast. (laughs) Exactly. And the big thing that frustrates me is here's the Hulk. I'm so angry. I'm incensed with rage, but I know who the good guy is with the gun versus the bad guy with a gun. Right. If you're just a rage monster, you just destroy. So that's actually why I like characters like Mr. Fix-It or Grey Hulk that are like a little bit more conscious and a little bit less strong or like Maestro. Kind of like how Marvel made the movies and made him a little bit smarter. Exactly. (laughs) Or by the time you get to Endgame where he's a lot of bit smarter. Exactly. Which I actually like. And a lot of people are like, (laughs) fuck off. It's fun, but I still hope he can like rage out. Yeah. So Magneto offers to stay behind when they get to the other side of that dimensional transport to send everybody back and does so sacrificing himself so that Reed and the refugees can go back to Earth 2149. And then 
Magneto destroys the machine, and the issue ends with a cliffhanger of Johnny and Sue Storm's mama coming home after 15 years. Where you been? Oh, you find out she's been researching the lost city of Atlantis, and you find Namor, and it's a complete, really fun recreation of that. But that is how Marvel Zombies enters the Marvel fucking ultimate universe what do you guys think because i just monologue so give me your impressions before we get to the next one i really enjoyed it from like what i did on research i was like i really want all these issues and i want to read them even though i hate reading <laughs> i'm the same way like i've tried to read comics but you gave me invincible oh so and we'll get into that well, for the next one because the next one is robert kirkman who of course wrote walking dead and invincible yeah and like i, I think i've read i only read two but i like them but i just got busy and I never came back to it. But so after watching the video for this, oh, who was it that did the uh, video? Comic cause it's like comic, comic Zodian. Comic, or comic Zodian. Zodian. Yeah. Custodian but, like a, but comics. He does a he does a <laughs> dramatic reading of it. And I felt so compelled to want to read comics. Like I've never had that feeling before. Yeah. After even after watching every single MCU movie and and being like super invested in it for that video to get me to want to watch it. I don't know what it is about these comics. They're just so batshit crazy. Yeah. That it just seems so cool. So I definitely want to. Yeah. And the artwork is what is just so interesting about this whole thing for me because I hate reading being like dyslexic, whatever. But the artwork for comics is what I've always loved. And, you know, obviously growing up in the 90s, I get drawn more towards that type of oh, yeah. art. But this art was like Because awesome. you had celebrity artists coming out in the 90s with Jim exactly. Lee, with Todd McFarlane. Yes. With Rob it. Liefeld. All of it. <laughs> I hate him so much. Sorry, Rob Liefeld. I hate you. Rob Liefeld, Liefeld, whatever, however you want to pronounce it, has the Conan the Barbarian sword from the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Oh, and wow. I hate him for it. So if I ever see him, I'm going to kick him in the nuts. Is that why you hate him? Well, and I think his art sucks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Exhibit A as to why his art sucks. Google search Rob Liefeld, Captain America titties, and you will not be disappointed. <laughs> All right, I'm doing it. It is the worst thing I've ever seen. It's an abomination. And speaking of abomination, shall we get into Marvel Zombies from 2005? Yes, let's do it. Marvel Zombies is a five-issue comic. So the spinoff, based on Mark Millar's one-off idea that he got mocked about, has a spinoff that's longer than its actual initial impetus, right? Like I said, top-selling trade paperback of all time. Here is the fun shit. I'm going to take you in a time machine, kicking and streaming back to 2005. <laughs> okay. You ready for this? I would pay lots of money to go back to 2005. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Because what's on TV? Spike TV is still a thing at this point. It is not Paramount Network. Okay. It literally still has the logo where it's a dick-shaped eye. <laughs> right? They had the 2006 Scream Awards. This wins Best Comic and Best Comic Book Artist went to Sean Phillips. So <laughs> That's a doctored one. Just bear in mind, <laughs> this is the same year that Devil's Rejects won the best horror movie and the same year that Brendan Routh won the best superhero for Superman Returns. Oh, uh, okay. We're talking about a ways back. So at this point, Robert Kirkman is already writing Walking Dead, right? And when they're conceptualizing this, they're all thinking, actually, I think it's specifically editor John Barber who is talking about, man, I really wish that we could find a writer like Rob Kirkman to do this book. You know, he writes superheroes, he writes zombies, and they're like, well, why the fuck don't we get Rob Kirkman? So they call him and he's like, yeah, <laughs> boing, that's simple, <laughs> right? And the timeline kind of changes. Obviously, comic book writers want to hype their new book. So sometimes it's presented to him where Sean Phillips is already his artist. Other times it's the idea. And then as soon as Sean's in, he's concretely in, right? But basically he says, I get to work with Sean Phillips. I mean, who can pass that up? And they're the covers of Arthur Sudam. Aside from me, it's just a winning package. He ultimately says that he'd do Marvel clowns if Sean was. <laughs> so, I'm down for that, too. <laughs> he admits that he was a little shocked that they let Sean and him do all the things that they got to do. And he thinks that the success, he says, it's you know got a bit of comedy if you don't really like Marvel comics, and that it's gone to the limits. So you don't get to see a lot of gore or twisted stuff in their usual books. So it has a certain uniqueness while still not necessarily exploiting, but playing on your nostalgia of the old, right? So it's accessible to anybody. Very if, much If so. this is your first experience with Luke Cage, God bless you. If this is you after reading Heroes for Hire all through the 70s and 80s, you're like, oh, fuck yeah, <laughs> right? So Kirkman on Phillips, he says, he's goddamn awesome. Every time in a, I turn in a script, I can't wait until the day pages start rolling in. And he talks about how fast it is and how awesome. 
Next, we go to editor John Barber. What else did he do? Oh, yeah, Ultimate Fantastic Four. So this dude's in the trenches when they're conceptualizing all this. Perfect. He was a big fan of all the stuff that Mark Millar was doing, and he loved the fact that this was as an exciting a time for him in comics as a comic book creator since Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Like, this is a big deal. Right. So he talked about, and he confirmed that Mark Millar has said, I only want to create this, and then you just do whatever you want with it. That's from the point one of conception, which I think is just, it's such a cool thing to be able to give a gift of this. Because especially when you look as Marvel Zombies comes in later, when we kind of go into episode two, so many characters who've been shit on or subjugated and completely cast aside, your Howard the Ducks, your Machine Mans, your yes. Morbius the Living Vampire, they all come in with rapid effect and they're enriched by writers who want to develop them and do something cool. You know, it goes back to the old philosophy. You know, Frank Miller, he picked Daredevil because Daredevil was the worst comic at the time. And he made it the best fucking comic at the time because he took a character who was dog shit, who was just about ready to be canceled and turned it into the legendary Man Without Fear series. Right. That's what he, these guys were able to do. And they did spinoffs. They brought back whole lines. Super exciting. Yeah, that's very cool. Because we even talked a little bit about Machine Man or whatever. And I was like, I don't remember this guy at all. And then going into these, I was like, dude, this guy's completely badass. hundred percent. Yeah. He's super fun. And there's a lot of really f like cool stuff. And his art is very fascinating in some of his earlier presentations. And it's a shame that he just disappeared. Right. That's one of the things. Back in the day, Marvel put out full page ads talking about how they had thousands of characters that you could license when they were trying to branch out into movie and TVs. I mean, oh, that's so awesome. Stan Lee was not making comics as far back as the 70s. Right. He was working in movies and TV trying to do that. He was a figurehead character. He didn't do anything with that. He wanted to be the TV guy. And at that point, Marvel was just trying to pump out anything. Yeah. The amount of awesome fucking characters I could refer you to that you've never even heard of would blow your fucking mind. Oh, I bet. And the crazy <laughs> thing is, is even with me being a Marvel fanboy, people could do the same fucking thing to me and go, hey, Jake, have you ever heard of this? And I'd be like, oh, uh, nope. <laughs> That's just the way it works. Yeah. So at this point, Marvel had been kind of courting Arthur Sudam for a long time. Arthur Sudam's a really fascinating dude who actually has a Grammy Award for playing guitar for Bruce Springsteen. So Who's that? I'm just kidding. I hate you so much. <laughs> My wife would have killed me for that one. Yeah, so right? Worry. I could definitely see that. So he said, quote, when I saw Marvel zombies coming down the road, for me, that said, this is a departure from the regurgitations of the same themes, which most of the superhero comics is. This is something really special. Even if the writer does a terrible job on this, this should be a pretty big hit. This is a guy who did variant covers for Walking Dead. He did his own zombie stuff. He was classically trained at the New York Academy of Figurative Art, which is a recreation of the Italian school that Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, Donatello, Splinter, Casey Jones, all these people <laughs> went to. So he actually worked on cadavers to learn how to draw human anatomy. Yeah, that's sweet. So can you kind of tell when it comes to the physiology and the stuff that you're seeing on those covers? The musculature underneath the rotted flesh, the carrion. Like, aren't yes. you guys excited? I love this shit. It totally pops off the covers. It's amazing. He has said multiple times, and not just pandering to the crowds, we're talking years removed, that Marvel Zombies he feels is his best work and is his personally favorite work. Wow. It would take him six weeks to do each cover. And he did them for two years because they kept selling out. Each time they sell out of a print, they do a variant cover. Right. This, is, this shows you a huge tonal shift for Marvel. This is not, I'm going to put out 17 covers for each issue. You have to buy all of them. Even though people have were chomping at the bit for these, they did it organically, and I think that's why the legacy of this speaks so well. They also gave him full creative control to do whatever he wanted. It was Joe Quesada's idea for him to do parodies, but it was his idea what prior ones he did parodies of. It's amazing. That right. Th this is just serendipity. This is, well, hey, fuck, why not? Right. This is not a deliberate plan. And that's the thing. Some of the greatest art of all time. Look at movies like Ghostbusters, where it just kind of, oh, this just worked. It was just lightning in a bottle. Yep. Sean Phillips, the guy who did the art for the rest of it. Why does Jake love him? Oh, he just did these comic. I don't know if you heard of it. Judge Dredd and Hellblazer. <laughs> the perfect template for this stuff. Yeah. And if you like Ed Brubaker as much as I do, he did Scene of the Crime, Sleeper, Criminal, Incognito, Fatal. He also did variant covers for Walking Dead issue 100. Huh. How fun. Serendipitous. Now, 
this is something I have to kind of disagree with my friend here on. All right. He said, it. quote, all the zombie characters were wearing my favorite versions of their outfits, except for Giant Man, who I'd much rather wear his first Goliath suit. Oh, well, I had to follow Greg Land's lead on that one. Wrong. <laughs> costume is not as good. The best Hank Pym costume is, of course, Yellow Jacket. Move on. <laughs> and one thing that I thought was great emblematic of each zombie in this is the fact that they don't have lips, right? They have right. these corroded, gross teeth and gums. Well, he also acknowledged that it's a lot harder to make somebody emotive when they don't have those lips, but he made do, which I thought was interesting. Like he, it's a very compelling thing to do. It sets you know, a clear status so that way you don't have to get too body figurative and do all this other weird stuff. Right. They can still keep their musculature, still be impressive, and at the same point, to be that aware and not just make them all bland because in my original vision where I'm like, oh, yeah, I just want violent, gory zombies, they don't need to emote. They just need to scowl. But in this, you literally have Spider-Man crying about the people he's eaten. Yes. That emotion is awesome. Yes. And we will get into it. So issue number one, the cover, of course, a parody of Amazing Fantasy 15, the debut of Spooderman. It picks up exactly where Ultimate Fantastic Four leaves off. You have Magneto on the roof of the Baxter building. He kills a bunch of zombies. Well, kills not necessarily correct because they come back, some of them. Because this version of zombies is not just destroy the brain. Right. You have to Because like Captain America's like half of its head's gone, right? Excuse me, it's Colonel America. Colonel America. Oh shit. <laughs> Chad just got school. <laughs> anyway, you're correct. He does lose half of his head and even picks out some of his brain. Right. Now, this actually happens in this sequence. Cap gets his shield stolen by Magneto, who then uses his own shield to cut off the top of his head. It's delightful. One of my favorite things that happens in all of Marvel Zombies, and I have read literally hundreds of pages of this by this point. <laughs> There's an awesome discussion that comes in where all of the zombies are talking about their decomposition. You have Daredevil going like, oh, like my legs are so bloated. And then Hank Pym's like, yeah, there's a giant gaping hole in your chest, you fuckhead. You don't have a heart to circulate your blood, so all of your blood is pooling in your ankles. How gross. And it ends with the blissful cliffhanger of the Silver Surfer arriving. Yes. If you know what the Silver Surfer is supposed to be, he doesn't beckon in a giant purple Herald. toilet. He's the Herald <laughs> of Galactus. And issue number two starts with a cover that's the parody of Avengers 4. You get Giant Man. You find out that he's been keeping Black Panther alive in a meat freezer, eating pieces of him to stay lucid enough to try and thwart the zombie virus, telling his friend all the while, you know I'm doing this is the right thing. How <laughs> fucking dark is that? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's great. The uh, the video that I was watching kept referring to him as T'Challa Twinkies. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Oh, I don't want to know why he's cream filled. Yeah. You need the wrong part. <laughs> you got to start with the, the easiest part. Yeah. Well, Pim says as he's eating him that he's starting to like the taste of flesh and he thinks that he would still eat flesh even if he found a cure. Wasp finds him and she is like, motherfucker, what? You're not sharing, motherfucker, what? So what's he do? He bites her goddamn head off. <laughs> and not in the metaphorical I'm yelling at you sense. He bites her fucking head <laughs> yeah. off. But because she's a zombie, she stays alive. Right. Awesome. Well, because he spits her head out, right? Exactly. Yeah. Because all the zombies think that zombie flesh tastes gross. Exactly. So Thor, what's he wielding these days? Uh, not Mew Mew, Cat Dennings. No, no, no. It's a piece of concrete with rebar in it because by being a zombie, he is no longer worthy to lift Mjolnir. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Womp and, womp. Yeah. So I've mentioned this to one of my friends. Year, I mean, we're talking about over a decade ago. And I was like, oh, I think that's so great. And he's like, well, why did he turn back into Donald Blake? I was like, because he's dead. <laughs> There's nobody else to turn back into. Like that Wait, whole what do you mean? So this is why I like <laughs> Ultimate Thor more. It's much more than the original. The original Thor, Donald Blake was a doctor who found a walking stick that he would clang into the ground and then he would become Thor. Yeah, it's a terrible, terrible story. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> so this is the original. This is how the original Thor came about. Yes. Well, <laughs> if you want well, to get hyper technical, it's not the original Thor. Oh, because shit. Jack Kirby. <laughs> Never mind. I didn't say anything. Jack Kirby had drawn <laughs> Thor with his hammer years before. And so when Stan Lee tries to take credit for the iteration of Thor and say, oh, I had this idea that I wanted to do Norse mythology. Jack Kirby had already done it in a DC comic before. But let's move on from there. <laughs> Literally, this version of Thor was so dumb that people would trick him into hitting his hammer on the ground thus causing him to change back into the para-abled Donald Blake. <laughs> yeah. 
So I actually really <laughs> like the fact that it's this way. And they were wondering why it wasn't popular. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you want to see a fun bit of referential art? Mm -hmm. In this, Colonel America had previously been president of the United States. Oh. The ultimate universe? Guess who becomes president of the United States? Ultimate Captain Donald America. Donald Trump. God damn you, the heck fire. <laughs> Don't remind me. I'd rather have to confront the zombie apocalypse than the orange-headed goofus. <laughs> it ends with the zombies attacking Silver Surfer as he heralds Galactus. We talked about this. this is one of the coolest things. We're talking about the physiology of superheroes. Yes. And obviously their sex organs. Yes. When Wolverine uses his adamantium skeleton to attack the Silver Surfer, he does so at the great expense of his rotting musculature, which flops off of his bones. Right. Oh, which, okay. yeah, because this is the question I brought up, too. I was like, you have the Hulk ultimate strength, pretty much like limitless, but yet his body's decaying. So you figure like if he does hit or smash anything, that force would just like rip his own flesh apart. And it starts to. Right. But they find a great excuse for that, which we'll get into. A power cosmic motherfucker. Yep. Oh, I love it. So issue three, Incredible Hulk 340. Silver Surfer cuts Iron Man in half. It's, oh, it's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> Wolverine does the slash, gets mangled. Spider-Man finally rips off this dangling broken leg that he's had the whole time, <laughs> which is hilarious. And, oh yeah, did I mention the fact that the Hulk bites the Silver Surfer's fucking head off? <laughs> like he's a bird in Dumb and Dumber, for Christ's sake. And that is where you start to see how certain zombies don't simply decay into nothingness because they're imbued with the power cosmic. The power cosmic is an infinite power, and thus you have a fraction of infinity. Ta-da! It ends with Galactus arriving and the zombies saying that they ate the Silver Surfer and they're still hungry. Oh. Yep. Oh. <laughs> you mean the giant purple man's going to fight a bunch of zombies? <laughs> yeah. Woo! The guy who eats planets. <laughs> it's good. Next, you go to issue four, which has a parody of X-Men 1. They fight Galactus. Pym goes back to his lab. The panther has escaped. And for some reason, he decides to take Jan Van Dyne's fucking head. For but, those of yeah. you who are uninitiated, that's the wasp. Right. I love the graphic of him walking out with <laughs> he had a stick wrapped onto his, his arm and wasp head in the other hand. like Hobbling out yeah. in, in this just desolated area. It's very, yeah, like you said, it's this is your most Walking Dead kind of moment in this, which I for love. For sure. Now, Panther gets found by the mutants that are on Asteroid M, and one of them attacks him. So what does he do? He throws the wasp's head at him. Die, motherfucker! <laughs> and then the, then the guys are like, well, there's only so many humans left. We have to save him. And he insists that they save Jan Van Dyne, who has been his friend. And just because she's a zombie doesn't mean she's no longer his friend. That plays in super significantly yeah. in Marvel Zombies 2. What you might think would be just a silly throwaway actually has substance. Now, I love this scene. Power Man and Spider-Man are playing Go Fish. <laughs> Spider-Man is wearing his mask and Power Man's making fun of him. Like, it's fucking stupid. You're a zombie, whatever. And he says that he's wearing it because he can't look in the mirror because he has to confront the fact that he ate his loving wife. Oh, well, excuse me. Loving wife. That he ate his <laughs> loving wife. I'm going to have to leave that fuck up in because that was, I turned into Elma Fudd. <laughs> now we know how you baby talking, bitch. Just a little bit. <laughs> Can you suck my pee pee? Just a little bit. <laughs> Oh. I wish would. <laughs> but anyway, oh. his loving life and his aunt. So that's where you find out that Spider Man kills MJ and Aunt May with his teeth. That's us. Stark, Pym, and Banner re eat the same chunks of the Silver Surfer, tearing holes in their stomach, pulling it out, putting it in, pulling it out <laughs> like a goddamn Pez dispenser from hell. Uh. They acknowledge the fact that it is diminishing, but it's keeping them lucid. That's what I said. Fucking clarity through cannibalism. They build a machine that amplifies their cosmic power to fight this motherfucker. And what's great, when you run into Galactus, he's fighting Spider-Man's rogues gallery. You have Vulture, Doc Ock, Venom. Oh, it's a great visual. And boom, we cut to the next one. Issue five, which is, of course, giant size annual Amazing Spider-Man 21. That's the parody. Pym says, fuckers, we only get this one chance. We got to do this. Let's destroy Galactus. Are they always parodies of other things that happen in Marvel Comics? Issue, or series one and two are. Three has parodies of other horror movies, such as Evil Dead and Army of Darkness. Four and five get wholly independent. Dead Days is wholly independent. But then there are variants of the series one through two, which have different ones. So, but they're always kind of derivative of... The Arthur Studium ones are, yes. Okay. Other people don't. 
but they are vaguely uh, referential. Some of them, some of them more so than others. Like we'll get into it. There's one with uh, Machine Man and Jocasta, which is the cover of Army of Darkness. Because that's something that would go if I were to read these, which I plan to do now, would go completely over my head. Like I would have no idea if you didn't say anything. Like some of the covers you would totally recognize from the other ones. Mm. Like the Spider Man one is the super famous one of him swinging with one hand holding the. But then, but I don't think that would. I don't think that would sing. I'd be okay. Like that looks familiar, but it's just Spider-Man swinging. It looks like the PS4 cover too, probably. But like, I'll give you a hint. This one, the Amazing Spider-Man 21 Giant Size Annual, it's him getting married to MJ. So you know that's not referring to the substance of it. So that's kind of your hint. And especially when you get into Marvel Comics too, like you have literally Thor fighting Silver Surfer, which Silver Surfer is already dead by that point. So you even as kind of a layman would know. You'll know, but like you're an extreme layman in terms of comics, in terms right. of comic history or whatever. It's a slightly different. When we get to zombies assemble, you'll know a lot more because that's a manga that's vaguely based on the MCU. Cool. Are you ready to stop interrupting me with stupid? Just kidding. That was good. Do it more. I like it. <laughs> oh, no. Don't close your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the zombies square off against each other. It's kind of clever. Where one armed power man versus three armed Dr. Octopus. <laughs> because it's a fair fight. But whatever. Anyway, <laughs> fuck you guys. Uh, Wolverine stabs Juggernaut in the mouth and then uses his cosmic blast to rip his fucking head off. Yeah. It's the coolest. The Red Skull rips Colonel America's brain out and then he gets killed by Spidey. Then they eat Galactus alive. It cuts to five years later. The denizens of Asteroid M return to Earth. The Panther has a prosthetic limb provided by Forge, who, you know, you might recall is a mutant who does metallurgy. Yep. And you find out that the zombies have used the power cosmic to go off into the cosmos and wreak havoc. It, we cut to a bedchamber of an alien prince or princess getting a bedtime story as the queen or king's royal staff comes in and says they're here. And boom, you see from the sky the Marvel zombies adorned in the vestiges of Galactus, ready to devour an entire fucking planet. And that is the end of Marvel zombies, a cliffhanger and not at the same time. But they knew before this was even finished, they were doing a second one. Oh, of course. But did you mention that the hunger goes away if they do not eat for long enough? That happens in two. Oh, okay. At this point, it's not established, but you, you're entirely right. Oh, okay. Because I, I thought when they come back from Asteroid M, they show what's her face in the metal suit. So she doesn't acknowledge that it's because of that. She Her head is in a jar and she's on a robot. Right. So she doesn't have access. She couldn't bite people because there's literally a partition between them. Okay. But later on, she acknowledges in Zombies 2 that she no longer has the hunger anymore. Oh, okay. And the timetable is very weird in Marvel Zombies 2. This one, I like the ambition of but it's just fucking weird. I This is like a 7.4 out of 10 for me, but I still think it's a good follow-up if you're wanting more that's not exactly the same. Right, okay. Shall we get into it? Let's. So one thing I want to kind of talk about when it comes to Robert Kirkman. At one point, he was over $40,000 in debt. <laughs> Credit card debt. We're not talking about like student loan debt. Okay. He Jesus. went to apply at like an Amazon warehouse or something like that and saw all these sad motherfuckers walking in and out and having to go through security. And he said, fuck this. I'd rather be destitute. And he gambles on himself. <laughs> His wife at the time supports him. They're completely broke. And then he becomes the guy who did The Walking Dead, becomes the guy who did Marvel Zombies. He becomes a tremendous success. He's now a partner at Image Comics. Think about that. I don't have that kind of constitution. No. I would never do that. Plus, I hate those stories because I bet you there's like 4,000 people that did the same thing that are homeless or working at McDonald's. Or begging <laughs> us for attention on Instagram or whatever. Yes. Please review my movie. And I'm yeah, like, and you're like, we would if it was good. <laughs> I would review it if I could, like, if it didn't look like it was shot on a phone from the 80s. It looks like you filmed this on Danny Glover's cell phone from Lethal Weapon. Exactly. Yes. But anyway, I love art. So please do continue to. I'm speaking about a very few <laughs> denizens where I'm like, good God. But my point is, it's amazing the fact that this worked out. Right. When you look at guys like Mark Millar who quit Marvel, who quit DC. When he quit DC, he said to his editor that he was shocked that that guy was the best sperm with how uninspired he was. <laughs> Burning Bridge. Then he invents the fucking Millar world, which gets sold to Netflix for millions of dollars. 
oh, wanted millions of dollars. Yep. Kings, mil- like these guys, these incredible gambles. I don't have it in me. I'm, no, I will not be quitting my job to be doing this podcast. I, full time. I totally would have done this completely single. But once you add like the wife and kids, no way. No way. Here's something I think that you'll enjoy specifically, Jack. Let's hear it. He had to beg his wife to read the first trade of The Walking Dead. <laughs> but she now watches the show religiously. Oh. How fucking annoying is that? That's I very much imagine like you being like, excuse me, wife, will you listen to this episode of a podcast? No. You <laughs> want me to go fuck myself. Okay, then. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Because She's... she listened to Slashettes, and that's my point. Yeah. She listened exactly. to the derivation. But it's the same thing. It's weird because she like doesn't like horror movies. But yet when like Walking Dead came out, she was totally invested and she watched it way longer than I did. I was like, oh, this is trash now. And she's like, oh, I just want to see how it ends. And I'm like, what the heck? Yeah. Make up your mind. <sighs> get Women. in or get out. Yeah. Shit or get off the pot. <laughs> Don't shit. Yeah. It's, you know, it's our thing. Put a cork in it. <laughs> I told my wife she could put a marshmallow up her butthole the other day. And she was like, oh, and I was like, it's more forgiving than a cork. <laughs> Not having experience with either. I was making a wild presumption. It Forgive is. me. And he admitted, <laughs> Robert Kirkman admitted that this series, quote, gets really stupid. So at least it he does. acknowledged that. Yeah, yeah. So it starts off with- But it's pa- fun. Yeah. Throughout. Yeah. It's a thing. So we'll get into it in episode two compared to Deceased, which is going on right now is the time we record yes, this. Yes, which I heard about it from one of our Patreons, which was awesome. It's it's very good. I started reading it after, and I'm very impressed by it. It's presented in an entirely different fashion. It is very linear. It is very serious. It's very dour. This is this never had that tone from Ultimate Fantastic Four, and it carries over throughout. So I think Zack Snyder versus Joss Whedon in terms of your films. Right. Um, I, I love that both exist. So I honestly think that we very, very seriously could be doing a deceased episode in the next year. I Dude, I'm it. down. More content in any form. I watch all the DC movies, even though most of them suck. So it's fine. Yeah, I've had a Blu-ray of Aquaman on my entertainment center since it came out. I haven't watched it. <laughs> I've seen it twice. Is it good? It's okay. Yeah, it's entertaining. It, I, I again, liked Momoa. it's not, if you compare it to like a Marvel movie, the the like flow is just not there. And there's like this weird like inconsistencies at time. And talking underwater is really stupid. But anyway, <laughs> if, you forget, if you forget those things, you're just watching it just to like get through something. It's very entertaining. I like how colorful it is. I like Momoa has, I mean, Momoa is just Thor. We can agree on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's a darker Thor. Wow. Racist much. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Anyway. And they don't make him a super genius, which I love. He's definitely himself. (laughs) It's awesome. He was also like Mr. Hawaiian Tropic model before he got that part. He was Conan the Barbarian. Kind of ruined it. Kind of hate him for it. But I've forgiven him because I liked him in Justice League. Right. I like Justice League. People hate that movie, but I went into it with the lowest of expectations. Yes. And I laughed at it the whole time. Yeah. Honestly. I enjoyed the fight scene in it uh, with Superman. It was cool. It was great. Honestly, it's on the level of like the Roger Corman Fantastic Four film, if you know what I'm talking about. And The Flash, I think, was the best part of that. Very good. Ezra Miller. Yeah, I would totally watch a just movie by him. Yeah, it's it's interesting. They've had seven directors on the Flashpoint movie. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we're in for a bad one, but we'll see it anyway. Of course. We're going to see the fucking Joker movie. Why not? Yeah. Of course, by the time this airs, then we'll have already seen it. So, oh, yeah. Make sure to check out our parking lot review. (laughs) Or it was terrible. I'm pretty sure it's getting good reviews. It is, but lots of things get good reviews before it comes out. Right. And it's because they just did it completely different and went a different direction. It changes the superhero genre and flips it on its head. Okay. Yeah, we've heard it. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. And it has a controversy. Okay. We're going to subvert your expectations. Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) So... This issue starts, the cover is, of course, a parody of Civil War. 40 years later, at the edge of the known universe, Pym says he can't believe they ate the whole thing. Thanos, <laughs> Gladiator, Fire Lord, Phoenix, with the original zombies being rebuilt with robot parts. It's super cool visual. Like, it is a very cosmic. That shows you the scope of what's become. Yeah. Hulk's there, too, right? Yes. Because that's the, the cool part that I told Shut you I loved. I'll let you talk about it after I say Blow this quote. Me. Right, Robert Kirkman <laughs> said, quote, I'm very proud of Fire Lord. He'll be making his first appearance in Marvel Zombies 2 issue one. We've also brought in Thanos and a couple other characters that I'll leave as surprises. <laughs> this is a time when Thanos was just a guy. Yeah. He was just a character. He was not 
Josh Brolin's masterful performance. He was the ripoff of Darkseid, who was almost the ripoff of another character right. that Jim Sterling was doing that ripped off the New Gods. Who was defeated by several people. Oh, yeah. He's been arrested <laughs> by NYPD before. Yeah. He wasn't some, like, big... No. Intergalactic God? No. No. <laughs> he had moments like the Infinity Gauntlet and Infinity War, and, uh, but other than that, no. Yeah. And those are very, very different in terms of theme. I mean, he was whole, even kind of jokey, right? At times, yeah. I mean, like, he was very sarcastic. Because girl like, defeats him. But that's more modern. Okay. That's more parody, but yeah. It's a good point. I mean, point. Thor beats him She's himself. literally called the unbeatable squirrel girl. Right. So. Okay. But would you like to say what happens when Hulk fights Prune Chin? Oh, it's great. He just slaps his freaking head with two hands and smushes it oh it's beautiful artwork like a grape yeah it's great love it wasn't that after he ac- accused him of it's his fault that there's no more food yeah because he eats <laughs> twice as much as everyone else exactly and this is where you get the great parody line hulk is hungriest there is <laughs> i love it so they decide hey we should go back to the earth find reed richards's old machine see if we can't fix it and go to another dimension Ta-da. And then as they're flying through the cosmos back to Earth, Spidey has this thought that his hunger is starting to fade. And this is something I love that Kirkman said. The thing is about the Marvel zombies is they're still the very same heroes that they've always been. Their personalities are still intact. It's just that they're controlled by this incredible hunger, which makes them do things they don't want to do. Some have embraced that and changed over the 40 years, and some are very much the heroic selves. Spidey stays a hero. Pym becomes a cop. Yes. <laughs> but that's the thing. But he was anyway, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which, if you like the Ultimates, Hank Pym is the fucking worst. Yes. But they make him irredeemable in the comics versus the MCU. It's like he slapped Jan Van Dyne once when he was like literally being depicted as being crazy. Reed Richards has deliberately slapped Sue Storm in the face with no consequence, but everybody hates Hank Pym for it. He also fucked Tigra, Tigra, however you want to pronounce it. It's kind of gross. Is it? She's like a furry dude. Dude, I uh, mean, what? I don't know. You're a weird man. <laughs> so a kid finds Hawkeye's severed head <laughs> in New Wakanda, and it's like, blah, 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 blah. it doesn't make sense because it's just been a guy living under a fucking rock, unable to do anything for 40 years. So he's literally gone crazy. Yes. But don't you think the decay would be like completely gone for his head? 40 years with just his head? Oh. I don't know, man. Rules are weird. I don't buy it. Neither do I. Who cares? (laughs) The Alkalites, which are the cult of Magneto, have a feud with the new Wakandans. And they use Hawkeye to show that without being fed, the zombie hunger completely fades because he's lived under a rock. He doesn't try to bite anybody. So he does serve a purpose. The zombies eat Ego, the living planet, on their way back. At this point, (laughs) he wasn't Star-Lord's dad because in the comics, he's not Star-Lord's dad. But I love this. Yeah. And they're like, how do we miss this the first time? <laughs> and they're literally eating an entire planet. And that's a beautiful image. Hawkeye is put into Wasp's old robot body. And Panther gets stabbed. Black Panther is like, they try to assassinate him with the Alkalites. Right. Well, what does Wasp do to save his life? She ends his life. Biting him and turning him into a zombie. And they eat the would-be assassin. That, my friends, is a very fun cliffhanger because you're like, how does this going to shake it? Exactly. Yeah. Marvel Zombies 2 2. Nope, it's not a ballet. It's the second issue. Has the parody of Marvel Comics 1 as the cover. Zombies are headed to Earth. Panther and the Wasps are detoxing in this jail cell. They get over it in a matter of days. So it's kind of weird that the cosmic zombies, in the millions or trillions of miles they have to travel back to Earth, don't wear off the hunger, but whatever. It's yeah. fine. Rules are weird. A little inconsistent, but okay. Panther and Wasp are talking about how superior their life forms are and how they never tire. Remember that. Remember when you we were talking about skipping ahead? <laughs> I didn't skip ahead at Jim's behest, and this is, this is right. important. Forge, Hawkeye, Reynolds break them out of their little jail cells. Pym wants to make a breeding ground when they get back to Earth. They're like, I'm going to make all of you fucking new Wakandans <laughs> fuck each other. And I'm going to eat your babies. <laughs> That's dark. But one thing I didn't figure out is why Hank Pym wouldn't shrink down to itty bitty thighs and just eat a lot of food. That's a little itty bitty piece of food. Very true. But I guess that's... Oh. And how would they have the willpower to stop when they ate the whole galaxy? They're going to be like, oh no, we'll just keep a small amount of people on Earth? Yeah, it makes no sense. Mm-mm. So Spatty, <laughs> Spidey, Spidey blasts <laughs> off part of his head in defiance, and the zombies attack him. 
And then here's something great. Power Man subsides with Spider-Man. Because they've had this kind of like tete-a-tete kind of relationship throughout the Marvel zombies. It's great. The continuity is awesome. The force field ends up blocking out all of the zombies, but Gladiator. Gladiator, you might know, the name Gladiator comes from a book that is the template for the solar-powered Superman of DC Comics. So the first Marvel parody of Superman, well, technically the first is Hyperion, but the more popular being Gladiator before we get to the century. Yes. So you could see Marvel has been very referential to DC, but arguably DC has done the same. Yada, yada. Basically, I'm saying, fuck. In a fair (laughs) fight, he wins. He beats Black Panther. He beats all of them. Power for power, he is incredibly strong. Arguably the strongest of all the zombies who's left. Issue three, Iron Man one. Badoo! Gladiator kills Panther, rips Spider-Man almost in twain, and then the OG Iron Man suit collapses Gladiator, kicks him in the fucking dome. They behead him. (laughs) You find out Forge is in the suit. Forge went to Stark Industries and got the old fucking suit out of cold storage, and you find out he's been doing all sorts of stuff, playing Finders Keepers with all these giant fucking big brain dude stuff. Upgrading him, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. So when the zombies get to Reed Richards' teleporty land, you bought a bunch of Herbie robots fucking their assholes. <laughs> I might be paraphrasing. But truly, the zombies outside of the portal go to Reed Richards' place. They get attacked by the Herbie robots. Like, fuck, let's just go eat the people. Like, that's all I can think about right now. <laughs> the guy who helps save the wasp kisses her. It's kind of weird. Forge gets Power Man new legs. As he laments not living. It's a very sad situation. (laughs) Forge then reveals that he has the transporter all along. And uh, lucky for us, it's inside the force field. And then he uses the body of Black Panther's dead son to make a new Colonel America. (laughs) And that's where you end off on issue three. That's what I mean. It gets weird. Yeah. Issue four has a parody of Nick Fury, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., They put the colonel's brain, which you remember was not intact. The colonel's brain had been sliced and diced by Magneto, scooped by Red Skull, and they put it into this poor kid's body without his consent. (laughs) Oh, Jesus. They fight with the Phoenix. Iron Man meets Colonel and Forge in the Iron Man suit. Hank gets crushed by the Panther. Claps wasps. Hawkeye, quote, easy arrows, fascists. (laughs) Wait. Excuse me, it's eat arrows, but my autocorrect, fuck that. I'm going to leave that mess up in, too. (laughs) And then with no affect, be my friend, question mark, as he looks to the zombie remaining. Banner attacks Reynolds to prevent the change in the Hulk and accidentally lowers the force field. Pym is about to eat the panther's wife, but realizes his own hunger is gone. Mm. Kind of a weaker cliffhanger, but let's move on. Issue five has, of course, the parody of Silver Surfer. Issue four. They have to stop the Angry Hulk, or you can call him the Hangry Hulk, whichever. (laughs) The Hulk kills Phoenix, which shows he is strongest, hungriest zombie alive. The Phoenix Force is truly something to be beholden to. Right. Reynolds sacrifices himself, blah, blah. Pym apologizes to the wife, his wasp. (laughs) He's like, hey, sorry I tried to kill (laughs) you. And offers her his condolences for her new lover being killed. That's dark and weird. (laughs) They fix the transporter, but then you find out that one of the Alkalite kids transports the zombies to a different dimension rather than transporting everybody else to a safe dimension. Because then he's like, well, all the problems are gone. The end? Question mark. I think that overall it's a pretty weak installment, but it's important. Yes. Now, I'm going to skip over Marvel Zombies versus Army of Darkness looking at the time here. I'm going to give you what you wanted. Marvel Zombies Dead Days came out in 2007. This gives you the origin of the zombies without a dynamite crossover, so you can find this on any Marvel platform. Okay. This is the origin of zombies. Okay. Colonel America bites Spidey. Spidey bites May. Spidey bites MJ. As Spidey is eating Mary Jane, he tells his Aunt May, stay away, lock yourself in the bathroom. And it's like, how quaint is that? Like, (laughs) you realize you're the guy who stopped a fucking train right like yeah. that door is not going to do anything so as he's escaped leaving his apartment he tries to eat nova the human rocket then daredevil's like whoa fuck that but then daredevil gets bitten too which leads to a tremendous discussion about his bloody ankles later on <laughs> colonel america 
calls the zombies to Avengers Mansion to try and cure them. And then this is where you find we cut to a zombie alpha flight, my favorite superhero team fighting X-Men. Aurora kills Northstar. Magneto kills Puck. Songbird, Guardian, and Sasquatch. You don't even know who they are. That's what I mean. Are you talking about like rich characters in Marvel who you've never even heard of? I've heard of some of those, yes. But who? yeah, Sasquatch. Who? For sure. Okay. Well, just because he was in a Battle of the Cryptids episode doesn't count. No, I actually have. And uh, Puck. Puck is my probably yeah, my. They're part of Alpha Flight, right? <laughs> yeah. According to the notes that I gave you, funny. You shut your whore mouth. Puck is a diminutive character. Issue five of Alpha Flight is actually it makes me the happiest of any comic book cover of all time, where it says it's Puck and he's doing cartwheels. Yeah. He was originally just a dwarf. Not a bearded dwarf, you know, like, but like a, I'm a person of diminutive stature. Right. And then Marvel was like, he's too powerful to be a dwarf. So can we add a story? <laughs> so he's an old tomb raiding thief who's possessed by a demon that was in a sword that keeps him small, but young forever. Yeah. <laughs> These are the rich stories that you know nothing about. Yeah. Awesome. No, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. You actually get to see how Pym kidnapped the Black Panther in this. You find out in this that She-Hulk eats Valeria and Franklin Richards because She-Hulk was a member of the Fantastic Four when the Thing went off to do his own series where it was the Thing team up. Okay. And so she infiltrates and kills them and eats them. And it's awesome. It's a very <laughs> dark thing because they're like pleading with her like, how? Like, we trusted you. Like, you used this against us. And she's like, sorry about it, bitch. I was hungry. <laughs> There's a great splash page with a bunch of villains fighting each other. There's some different colored Deadpools. And there's a different colored Dark Hawk, which makes sense because, again, we're in a different universe. Right. Tons of Kirby characters. Nova freaks out because they're outnumbered and he's like nobody backs him up. They all want to fight the good fight. That shows the Avengers eating Jarvis, which is dope. It shows Spidey eating Jameson, which is dope. Reed is doing an autopsy on the Guardian, who is a character from Alpha Flight. and He's freaking out about what amazing improvement this is on the physiology of humans. <laughs> they don't eat. They never get tired. They have infinite energy. Like, this is a, a way more efficient creature. He calls in the Fantastic Four, and he says, look, these are my findings. This is the, this is the crazy thing. Like, these are actually amazing creatures. We, we should be so lucky. And they're like, what are you saying, Reed? He's like, well, basically, I injected you all with the Marvel zombies disease, and it should be taking effect in three <laughs> Two, one, they become zombies. And he says, go ahead and bite me. Turn me. Let's all be together. That is how the thing gets changed into a zombie by a mad scientist, Reed Richards, who has lost his fucking mind in the throngs of grief and despair from seeing his own children eaten by a hunger virus infused She-Hulk. Oh, how it's did he inject them? <laughs> I don't know. They don't That's show suppository? <laughs> That's not a bad idea. I'm just going to say that out loud. The Fantastic Four, this happens. You have Iron Man who actually does the transporter. He's the one who has this idea using one of Reed's old devices. Reed then kills Iron Man, turning him into a zombie. And then that's where you get the template to go into Ultimate Fantastic Four with them contacting Reed Richards saying they're going to, quote, spread the gospel right. of the hunger. Okay. Which becomes a huge theme as you move on, but... This is more of the virus having like a brain mentality, like... Much more. Yeah, the gospel and all that junk. Yeah, so I pretty much monologued for an hour and a half. What do you guys think? Is this something that... I, could you see anybody doing this as a movie effectively? Oh my God, I would love this as a movie. It would definitely be very difficult to do. I think it could be done in a Peter Jackson dead alive kind of sense where it's absurd violence, but I don't think it could be. I think a Taika Waititi is the guy you would have to do and you'd have to keep it very light. There's no way that Marvel would be doing a very serious DC style glowering evil gross thing. Yeah, I think you could have like a little bit of like the super dark scary horror elements, but yeah, there should be like some sort of levity in it. 100%. Now, like you could use Deadpool as someone to be like Definitely bringing that part out. Spider-Man 2 and stuff. So in the MCU, you might be aware that in years to come, maybe current to when you're listening to this, who knows, the next Doctor Strange movie is the Multiverse of Madness. So that could very well involve Marvel zombies in some capacity. People have said that it's hinted at like with characters like Tony Stark coming as a vision to Spider-Man as like a zombie. Not really. I think that was a kind of tenuous grasp, but right. it's very easily possible. And with you acknowledging a multiverse, 
it's almost inevitable. Just a question as to what degree you'll do it. Yeah. And with Marvel, I mean, they have to go big or go home after The Last Avengers. So Yeah, and this is a global level threat that becomes a galactic threat. Exactly. What about you, Jimbo? Did you like it? Did you love it? Did you want more of it? Yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I I think it's in like its entirety by itself, I think is unfilmable. Yeah. Completely. But like you said with Doctor Strange, like some sort of glimpse into it, like just absurd bloody chaos happening where you're like, that is Spidey zombie and that is Iron Man's a lobby and like that would be pretty cool. Yeah. If yeah, you, like you look through one of those stupid sling ring things and it's just like a TV screen into just carnage. Right. I could see that. If you did just like the first part, I think you could do it where Richards gets tricked into going into the portal and then he's like, oh crap, all the world is zombies, all that. That would be a very interesting like HBO style series. Yeah. Because there's just so much content. You can't do a four hour movie for it. So you'd have to do it like in a series. Right. Like it obviously have to be pared down. Exactly. A lot, but. It'd be a good way of showing like this. This ain't your grandpappy's fantastic four, right? Which I think, which they've been ruined. Everything that they've ever touched movie wise has been terrible. No, there is a tremendously good Fantastic Four movie. It's called The Incredibles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, think about That's it. That's true. Violet is Sue Storm. Yep. Elastigirl is Reed Richards. Mister Incredible is the Thing, and of course, Dash is as close as you're going to get to Human Torch. Well, you get the baby who actually does light on fire. Yeah, but I mean, but, yeah. in terms of the braggadocious nature of being exactly. blonde, I mean, that sibling-ness, the sibling yes. rivalry, it's the all there. The attitude is all there. Yeah. yeah, honestly, it's the best Fantastic Four movie you've ever seen. Yeah. And it, it amazes me how many times I tell people that, and they're like, oh, it never occurred to me. I'm like, are you <laughs> fucking with me right now? <laughs> Jesus. So I highly recommend this series, especially if you have Marvel Unlimited, you can just read it all at once. It's awesome. Yeah, I've literally read hundreds of pages of this and I'm still eager for more. I'm actually going to check out uh, Respawn. And honestly, this hit me at a time where I was kind of already hitting zombie fatigue in 2005. Yes. And the fact that it holds up and in a lot of ways, it's more charming now than it was then. I really appreciate it. And especially with the MCU and seeing things, it's, it's definitely refreshing. Like Kirkman said, to have something that's gory and unique and just different than what Marvel generally does. It's awesome. Yeah. And you get a lot of the weird characters popping in and out, which is great. Yeah, we'll get into it too. Like yeah. Fred Van Lente just goes nuts, right? And he like he brings back the Midnight Suns, which I'm I like literally. If you look in my notes, you'll see all caps Midnight Suns exclamation <laughs> points. So we'll get into it. So stay tuned for part two. This is our first two part episode, so I highly anticipate that listenership on part two will just crash and burn. <laughs> but if you stuck with us, I appreciate it. I'm sorry if this is a sausage fetch topic, but it's just fun and. I hope you liked it. Make sure to reach out to us on all social media platforms, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, just Gmail. Do whatever you can to let us know what it is that you do want. And we'll be happy to try and entertain you, not only with our witty banter, but also like rich research. I try to do that with everything that we do. I want this to be informative and self-sufficient. I anticipate that a lot of you have never read Marvel Zombies, but you might, like Jim, want to do so now, even with it being spoiled. Great. And if this is your second choice media and you're sitting on a train, you have nothing better. I'm glad to have distracted you from the mundane elements of your life <laughs> as you rot away like a Marvel zombie. Is it time for the closing remarks, gentlemen? Enjoy killing time. Until next week. Beep, beep, fuck boys. And for my esteemed colleagues, for Brian at home, this is Jake reminding you to go out there and do something you love. And remember that all work and no power play makes Jack a dull boy. I didn't retire it after The Shining. Kept it.